Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about aspartame. Aspartame is sold as NutraSweet, and as a matter of fact, they tend to blend different of the non-nutritive sweeteners together. So, for instance, if you get equal, equal is aspartame plus a sulfame. The aspartame itself is what's considered an artificial non-saccharide sweetener. Non-saccharide doesn't contain any sugar, yet it's about 200 times sweeter than sugar. It's actually the combination of the methyl ester of aspartic acid that's an amino acid and phenylalanine that's another amino acid. So it's two amino acids that are sort of plopped together and the product is present in more than 6,000 different consumer foods and beverages, not only the diet soda and the other diet drinks that you know about, but it's also present in the instant breakfast mixes and breath mints and cereals, it's in frozen desserts and laxatives and juices, it's present in the chewable vitamins, present in wine coolers and yogurt, present in those tabletop sweeteners that you get when you go to the restaurant, and it's also present in a variety of pharmaceutical products. Well, the chemical was synthesized in the laboratory in 1965. Food and Drug Administration started approving it in the early 1980s. Now, in order to link the two up, it needs some sort of a chemical reaction. Laboratories have that down pat. It's actually one of the most rigorously tested food ingredients. Actually, more than a hundred different federal government authorities have evaluated it from the FDA here in the United States as well as a variety of other agencies in the United Kingdom, the European Union, Health Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all evaluated and, and seem to all agree that it's relatively benign product, doesn't seem to cause side effects for the overwhelming majority of people and if you look at the caloric intake, caloric content, it's extremely small. It contains about four kilocalories per gram, but because it's so sweet and used in such small quantity, it basically doesn't add any calories. Now, there's also a question about does it differ from the taste of table sugar? And the answer is for some people, yes. It all depends on how fast the sweetness comes on, how long the sweetness lasts, does it leave a bitter aftertaste? Those are all issues that people have that make them either opt for the aspartame or one of the other non-nutritive sweeteners on the market at the present time. Now, if we look at stability, if we look at a solution, well, in solution, if it's an alkaline solution, it breaks down very fast. If it's a neutral solution, it breaks down very fast. Half-life is only a few days. If we look at an acid solution, like a soda pop, where the pH is about 3 to 5, the half-life is about 300 days. If you need it longer, well, maybe for the syrup in a fountain drink, then you mix it with some saccharin or some other non-nutritive sweeteners because the product can't really undergo heating, it seems that it breaks down, it's not really a desirable product for baking. Now, if we look at the two component parts, we find phenylalanine, that's an essential amino acid, it's required for normal growth and the maintenance of life. People have argued that, well, if you get too much phenylalanine, that that might not be healthy. On the other hand, if you look at the amount of phenylalanine that you get in your diet from meat and from fruit and from milk, those levels dwarf the quantity that you get in the aspartame. So very small quantity overall from the aspartame. Now, there is one exception. In people who have phenylketonuria, people born with an enzyme deficiency, and they lack the enzyme that's necessary to break phenylalanine down. You can't break phenylalanine down, then it might lead to brain damage, and that's obviously a significant issue. So when, phenyl, when the aspartame is present in a product, the product has to have the label containing the phrase that its PKU contains phenylalanine. Basically, that's here in the United States. It's in the 
United Kingdom, it's in Canada, it's in a variety of other countries. Then we have the aspartic acid, that's the other component. But again, remember, you get much more phenylalanine in your diet than you do in the aspartame. You get much more of the aspartic acid in your diet than you do when you consume phenylalanine. As a matter of fact, if we look at the top 10% of consumers of the aspartame, they only get about 1 to 2% of their daily intake of aspartic acid from the NutraSweet. So that's very important to realize that the amount you get is extremely small. Now, one of the issues that people have brought up is that, well, if you look at the breakdown of aspartic acid, it goes through methanol, obviously methanol is not good for you, through formaldehyde, again, not healthy for you, and it's completely oxidized into formic acid. Well, it's, again, unlikely to be of any concern because the amount of methanol that you consume through fruit juice and citrus fruits and in fermented beverages considerably greater than the amount that you get when you consume aspartame. So, again, not an apparent issue. And if we try to evaluate the amount of methanol in the blood, actually we can't find that it's present, broken down extraordinarily rapidly. Now, how much is the acceptable daily intake? We call it the ADI. How much can you consume without having to worry? You consume an awful lot. In Europe, the different scientific agencies say you can consume up to 40 milligrams a kilogram, which means about 75 packets a day. Here in the United States, they say about 50 milligrams per kilogram maybe about 60 packets a day. Well, the primary source of exposure to aspartame here in the United States, of course, is soft drinks and fruit juices and chewing gum and pharmaceutical products. So if we look just at, say, diet soda, well, an average 12-ounce can of diet soda contains 0.18 grams of aspartame. So if we look at an average 165 person, 165 pound person, that person would have to consume about 21 cans of soda to get to the limit. And if you exceed the limit, we don't know that anything bad is going to happen. So if we look at people who consume relatively large quantities for the body weight, if we look at children, seems perfectly safe. If we look at diabetics again, perfectly safe. Well, what happens to the aspartame when you consume the product? It's broken down. It's broken down even at levels as high as 200 milligrams per kilogram. It's broken down so that we don't find any aspartic acid in the bloodstream. It's rapidly broken down. The products, the aspartic acid, the phenylalanine, the methanol, and the different byproducts just go right on out. It was discovered in 1965 in a laboratory at G.D. Searle and Company. Actually, they were working to try to stimulate a peptide hormone, and this was a, a byproduct, or it was involved in the the production of the chemical that they really wanted. This is a dipeptide. It contains the two amino acids. They were looking for a tetrapeptide. And actually, the chemist, James Slater, he licked his finger to lift up a piece of paper, and he said, by gosh, that tastes very sweet. Well, in 1974, it went before the Food and Drug Administration, and the commissioner said, okay, but the next year, they put a hold on it or a stay on it because they found in 1975 that maybe Searle was a little bit sloppy and they had some issues with some different kind of chemicals. They had a problem with flagell and they had a problem with aldactone. And they said at the FDA, let's look at about 25 different studies, including 11 on aspartame. And he found some serious deficiencies. Now, at the time, they wanted to appoint a U.S. attorney 
to look into convening a grand jury to see if the chemical company actually falsified some of the data. But that U.S. attorney sort of dawdled for a bit and the statute of limitations ran out. Well, the FDA evaluated these other studies and then the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition evaluated the product and said, you know, there are some deficiencies, but they really don't have anything to do with the safety. So in order to make sure everything was on the up and up, in 1980, the FDA convened what's known as a public board of inquiry. And they looked at the relationship between aspartame and brain cancer. They found that it didn't seem to cause any brain cancer, but they recommended against approval of the product because of some unanswered questions in rats. Now, after they had done the study, a Japanese study came out. And the Japanese study, looking at specifically the potential for brain cancer, they said there really isn't any. So the chairman of the expert panel was then asked, if you had this information available, what would you have said? He said, well, we would have given an unqualified approval. So the then commissioner of the FDA, different than originally, he said, well, after he looked at the product, looked at the evidence, had scientists look at it, had the lawyers look at it, he said, let's just approve the product. So it was approved, and then in 1983 it was approved in carbonated beverages, 1993 approved in other kinds of beverages and confectionaries. And as a matter of fact, by 1996 the FDA removed all restrictions from aspartame. Now, in the European Union, they had done that basically in the 1980s in several countries. EU-wide, they said it's okay in 1994. They reaffirmed the safety in 2002 and 2006. Now, it gets a little iffy because the lawyer, the U.S. attorney, he actually went to work for a company that represented G.D. Searle and the commissioner of the FDA, after he retired, he joined a PR firm that just happened to do the PR for G.D. Searle. Well, now we have another issue. And the other issue was, this is prior to World Wide Web and prior to email, the Usenet. There was a fictitious name, Nancy Markle. And it was a circulated hoax letter that said, that if you consume the aspartame, it's going to increase the likelihood of multiple sclerosis and lupus and methanol toxicity and blindness and spasms and shooting pains and seizures and headache and anxiety and birth defects. But that was thought to be a conspiracy theory. So the Senate requested the GAO, General Accounting Office, to actually look into the evidence. And again, 1987, they found that everything seemed to be on the up and up, didn't seem to be any specific problem. Another issue came up with the Spartame in 1996, when 60 Minutes, they did a show talking about the potential for brain tumors and the FDA approval process and the revolving door where people seem to go from the drug industry, I'm sorry, from the FDA to the drug industry. Then we had the Ramazzini study that came out of Bologna, Italy, and it claimed that the aspartame caused malignancies in rodents even if the rodents were consuming at relatively normal levels. But the Food and Drug Administration, the European Food Safety Authority, others evaluated the Ramazzini study. And what they found was that there were significant methodological issues. And when they asked the cancer center to provide the slides and release all of the data, they refused to do that. So Health Canada and the British Committee on Carcinogenicity of Chemicals and Food, they all found the data lacking. Well, now we have other kind of options available. We have the sucralose, we have the stevia. All of these are present and, and the person can consume whatever. On the other hand, the full assessment done by the European Food Safety Authority in 2013 
found that not only was aspartame safe for the general population, it also was safe for infants and children and pregnant women and adolescents and people who were obese and people who had diabetes and people who were lactating and even people who were heterozygous, only had one gene for the phenylketonuria. They could consume the product without any problem. Didn't seem to raise the blood pressure, the systolic or the diastolic blood pressure, didn't change the blood sugar, didn't change the triglycerides or the cholesterol, didn't seem to cause any change in mood or behavior, no neurocognitive problems, no increased incidence of cancer. Actually, the incidence of cancer was looked at by the National Cancer Institute, the Food and Drug Administration, the European Food Safety Authority, and none of them found that there was any link to cancer reviewed again in 2016. No link to cancer in humans, no link to leukemia and brain tumors, variety of other cancers. As far as neurologic and psychiatric problems are concerned. Well, if you go to the consumer magazines, find that, well, it causes seizures and headaches and mood changes. On the other hand, there's no evidence that the standard doses have any plausibility in causing any of these kind of issues because remember, we're talking about an extraordinarily small quantity of the phenylalanine and the aspartic acid consumed and broken down in the body right away to those two amino acids that are present every time you have a piece of meat or a piece of cheese or a steak. So they didn't find that there was any problem as far as neuropsychiatric problems were concerned, no panic attacks, no mood changes, no hallucination, no ADHD, no seizures. Well, can it cause migraines? Probably not. Uh, there is a question of whether it might be one of the triggers. Most people believe it is not. Well, what about metabolic effect? Well, interestingly, everyone consumes the diet products because they think it's going to make you lose weight. Well, it might decrease the caloric intake, but it doesn't seem to change the body weight, doesn't seem to change the blood sugar, the amount of insulin that you produce, doesn't change the triglycerides or the cholesterol, might increase the HDL a little bit in some studies. 2017, the Canadian Medical Association Journal said no evidence that it causes weight loss, no evidence that it increases or decreases the incidence of type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease. Reason to consume the product, maybe, is to reduce the amount of sugar that you consume because we know that the sugar you consume might have significant problems. So they did an interesting study at Boston Children's Hospital, and what they did was they looked at people who were consuming the sugar-sweetened beverages, the regular Coke, and then they switched them either to the regular Coke or to the diet Coke or to just water. And what they found was that overall, looking at those individuals, there was no change in the weight, no change in the metabolic markers of health. But they did find that people who had the most fat around their midsections did tend to lose weight. So if you're lean or if you're normal weight, doesn't seem to make any difference. If you happen to be heavy, then it appears that you can lose weight if you consume the aspartame. And children on diet soda followed up for about 18 months seem to have less weight gain if they consume the diet drinks. Now, the scientific advisory came out 2018. They found that the use of low calorie sweetened beverages that would be probably an efficient strategy to go from the sugar sweetened beverages to the non-caloric beverages to the chemicals like water, to the, the drinks like water, so water being preferable. So at the end, what the study showed was that people who consumed the regular sugar, well, those people who contained the sugary sodas over a period of a year or 18 months, they seemed to gain about 10 pounds. Those people, if they had uh, abdominal obesity, they only gained about a pound. People who were switched to unsweetened beverages, water, well those individuals seemed even sometimes to lose a little bit of weight, maybe only about half a pound. Well, 
how does it work that you could consume a product that doesn't have any calories and it could make you gain weight? Well, that's an interesting subject. And it seems that it might have something to do with the bacteria in your gut. So we know, for instance, that cattle that have these non-nutritive sweeteners added to the livestock feed, they seem to have increased food efficiency and they gain weight. Well, that's sort of an interesting subject. So if we look at taking the bacteria from the stool, doing the stool transplant, from animals that are somewhat heavy into germ-free animals, and keep those germ-free animals on the same kind of diet, then it seems that those animals actually gain weight. Well, what's all this mean? Does it mean that the non-nutritive sweeteners, the aspartame, can alter the bacteria, disrupt the bacteria? Can they confuse the brain somehow because of the change in the gut bacteria? Well, actually, at the present time, we don't know. That's just a thought. Now, if you're an average adult, more than 40% of you are going to consume a non-nutritive sweetener every day. If you're a child, more than 20% are going to consume non-nutritive sweeteners. And non-nutritive sweeteners are the sucralose, the aspartame, the stevia, the saccharin. And what we know is that if you look at people who have sugar-sweetened beverages, so you have the regular Coke instead of the Diet Coke, in the health professionals follow-up study, 28 years, the nurses health study, 34 years of follow-up, we find that people who, contain, who, who consume the sugar-sweetened beverages are going to have an increased all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease-related death, increase the mortality by a, about 10% per every serving of the sugary beverage per day. So what's the bottom line? Is The bottom line is that aspartame isn't the answer necessarily if you want to lose weight. It might prevent some people from gaining weight. And remember, it contains common amino acids that are present in every hamburger, every glass of milk, anything that contains a protein. And the question is, is it harmful? And the answer is that it's been looked at time after time after time, and although there's been some controversy about the way it first came to market and some of the early changes at the FDA, there's nothing that's ever been shown that we really have a problem. So, actually, I, contain, I consume the spartan-containing beverages pretty much every day. I don't think I'm any worse the wear. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. Consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.